this week and next week, FYI. But I uh, heard a news story this week that there is a couple in England who is desiring somebody to come in to their home and teach their 9 and 10 year old the birds and the bees. Two parents that obviously maybe are not confident or comfortable in talking about sex to their children have posted a, an ad that is willing to pay $3,500 for you to come in and talk about sex to their kids. And I'm almost thinking about contacting and saying, will you fly me out there? I would love the opportunity to talk about these things. Uh, but how many parents have shirked that responsibility? How many parents maybe uh, found it awkward with you when you were younger to, to explain to you the birds and the bees or the topic of sex? How many of you as a parent have had a difficult time talking to your own children about this topic? And I'm wondering just how many, and you don't need to raise your hands, even had the conversation with your parents. Because I'm assuming that don't all parents have this talk with their kids. And I guess by assuming that just shows my ignorance. That most people probably maybe never got a good conversation on this topic with their parents and have learned most of what they know about sex, not from their parents, but from the culture at large. How many of us learned about sex perhaps through the pornography that we got a hold of when we were younger or the the videos we have seen or the the playground conversations that have taken place just like my kids this week one of my children came home and said there is a girl who talked to me about song of solomon solomon this week and i thought to myself oh yeah what did you guys talk about you know uh if you don't know song of solomon is a book in the old testament which really celebrates sexual love between a husband and wife. And most Jewish boys, uh, if you were Jewish, you were not allowed to read Song of Solomon until you were the age of 13. Now, that may not mean anything to you because when you read Song of Solomon in today's cultural context, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But let me just tell you, when Solomon ex is get excited about climbing the palm trees and plucking the fruit from the palm trees, it's more than just a literal understanding of what he's celebrating there so and we'll talk a little bit about song of solomon here in a bit so the topic of sex not one that i i'm going to shy away from because sex is something that is a, a, a wonderful gift given to us by god it is something wonderful that two people in the context of marriage man and woman husband and wife are able to 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 celebrate yet you would look at our culture and think we've gone insane when it comes to the topic of sex and I was thinking to myself and just really praying about, Lord, how do you want me to, to tackle this topic with my church family? And instead of doing one week, I wanted to do two weeks because I felt like I would not be a pastor shepherd to you if I didn't first lay a foundation. You know, I, I want to address the cultural endemic of uh, this insane sexuality that seems to be rampant around us. But first, before we address that, I think you need to understand where the heart of God is when it comes to this topic. And so this morning is really foundational. Uh, the, the principles of, of things we need to understand as Christ followers, as God lovers, what, is, what are the principles? And then next week we get to talk about the practices, for better or for worse, of, of where our society is at. How do we engage the culture? How do we uh, encourage the culture when it comes to these things? Because... None of us are immune from the, the topic of sexuality because we're all sexual creatures. Turn to Genesis chapter 1, and here we get the, the very first principles God gives us regarding sex. And we've, we saw this a, a few weeks ago as we saw the creation of man, woman, male, female. And this is the apex of God's creation, right? What God has created is man and woman. He, he doesn't just say good. These are very good. These are, these are two... This is one humanity displayed in two types of persons, male, female, that represent uh, the image of God on earth, the likeness of God on earth. And the Bible doesn't stop there. The Bible continues till the end of Revelation and, and talks about this topic of sex. And what we need to understand is that God gives us a big picture view of sex. 
we tend to operate with little picture mindset of sex. See, God wants us to understand the, the 30,000 foot view of life that's found in the Bible. And, and he is going to redefine and reorient our lives and our understanding, not just in the topic of sex, but everything. When it comes to money, when it comes to work, when it comes to prayer, you name the topic. God wants us to understand the big picture vision of why this is important. Because while sex is physically pleasurable, it is to be understood in a larger context. And so it is much more deeply emotional and spiritual than we would ever, ever realize. And this is an important topic because souls are at risk. There is something unique about sexuality, and especially when it comes to sexual sin, that makes it different than any other part of our lives. And we're going to talk about that here in a moment. So I was reading the article about comedian uh, Haziz Hansari, who uh, uh, was uh, basically in, uh, held guilty for not respecting another woman's desire to not move forward with having sex with him. He took advantage of a woman uh, a couple of years ago. It broke into the main, uh, the main news feeds, and all of a sudden women started coming together saying, I felt the same way. I never gave consent to go this far with this man and and we've had the me too movement uh come about several several months ago and something i talked about last week when it came to the topic of femininity is you know we we're recognizing that something's not right something is is uh is is not right and we have a responsibility to to love those women that have been horribly treated in these abusive situations and i and i want you to know ladies that there is healing to be found in Christ, and that I'm going to hold men to the fire to be more responsible and more loving and more caring when it comes to their treatment of women, and and uh, and not that it's exclusively men to, to to female, but we need to understand that there is a something going on in our culture, and it's raising a lot of eyebrows and bringing a lot of attention, which I think is good. But the problem is there seems to be among our sexuality this this emptying of what is supposedly supposed to be sacred. And, and it's becoming much more trivial in a lot of people's understandings. And I'm reading this article and how women have experienced similar encounters like the one that this woman experienced with Haziz Hansari. And uh, one writer says, uh, we've turned sex into just another social interaction and emptied it of any supposed sacred or taboo elements. She says there's an inherent danger in having sex with someone who does not know you and therefore does not particularly care about you. And then she continues and talks about a 2002 study in which participants were asked their feelings after a casual hookup. And if you're not familiar with that term, there's been research done over the past decade on this hookup culture. That it's sex with no strings attached. So 2002 research was done, and they asked uh, participants' feelings after they had a casual hookup. 35% were regretful or disappointed, while only 27% felt good or happy. Fast forward 10 years, 2012 Canadian study found, listen to these statistics, 78% of women and 72% of men, we're talking three quarters, who had uncommitted sex reported a history of feeling regret after the encounter. So in 10 years, the number has gone from one-third to three-fourths, feeling regret after the casual encounter. In addition, the American Psychological Association notes that among a sample of 1,700 individuals who had experience a one-night stand, found that men had stronger feelings of being sorry because they felt they used another person, whereas women had stronger feelings of regret because they felt used. These are statistics that you're not going to just pick up in the, in, the, in, the, in the media. These are not just things that are going to be talked about on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. The fact that the, the culture seems to communicate that your bodies are just shells and you can just go ahead and operate yourself however you want is just wrong because it goes against statistical research. That was from an article called Divorcing Sex from Love it Hasn't Made Sex More Fun. 
more safe or less complicated. We need to understand God has designed us for so much more than this. So we're going to talk about four points this morning. Lay a, lay a foundation. And we start with Genesis. And the first point is this. There's the issue of creation. Sex is about design. And, and design not just because he's created male and female and now there's this anatomical perfect fitting together of the sexes. What we need to understand is that sex is so much more than a, a physical connectedness. When, when Genesis 1 says he created male, female, literally those words mean piercer and pierce. But what we see in chapter 1 is further enhanced in chapter 2 where it says a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. They were naked and not ashamed. What we need to understand are, are two important principles here in Genesis chapter 1. The first is this. God is for sex. Yes! He is not against sex. He is the one who has designed us for us to experience this wonderful uh, thing in, in the context of, of, of marriage and between a man and a woman. He is for sex. He has designed us this way. But the second point is important because sex is for marriage. And these are foundational truths found in Genesis 1 and 2. And so the parameters are clear. The boundaries are established. God is for sex. Sex is a good gift from God. And secondly, sex is for marriage. And what do we see in marriage? And it's further reinforced by the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels. When a man and a woman are joined in the context of marriage, this is the perfect place for that experience to happen. And why is sex for marriage? Because there's two things that happen between a man and woman in the context of marriage. They have the opportunity to populate. Sex is for population, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Now, this is generally speaking because I understand that some couples aren't able to have kids. And, and that's okay. God meets those people and those, those places of struggle and ministers to them. Doesn't make you any less of a man or a woman if you don't father or mother a child right? Uh, this, this has to do with even being single. You know, God is not saying that everyone's going to get married, even though the majority of people probably do marry. The idea in scripture is found that those who are single are able to consider the riches of Christ and serving him far more glorious and important than having a physical sexual experience. That God comes in in those places and becomes our deepest satisfaction. We tend to set sex up as the, the, the penultimate goal of our physical or spiritual or mental experience. And it's not. Jesus is the penultimate goal and satisfaction of our desires. Right? I was a kid in high school saying, I hope Jesus doesn't come back because I haven't had sex yet. And essentially what I'm saying is sex is better than the return of Christ. And I'm amazed that God didn't strike me down dead right there at that moment. God's saying, you foolish young man. You're, you're sitting there going, you think sex is better than the return of Jesus. You think sex is better than wholeheartedly serving Christ. Because the Bible says, what you are not concerned with in marriage or with a family, you are now much more free to serve God in your singleness. Let me just tell you right now, churches do a horrible job of treating single people. They treat them as if they've got the scarlet letter. They treat them as if they are anathema. Like, what's wrong with you? And, you're, and we tend to poo-poo the idea that people are single. And I'm going to tell you what. The Bible says those who are single have a better place and opportunity to serve Jesus in their singleness. And that's what we need to communicate to our young people, to our older people who are, you know, Christ is your satisfaction. Christ is your satisfaction. And now you are poised and positioned to serve him take advantage of those seasons and so while god is for sex and sex is for marriage sex is meant to populate but is also meant to bind there's an idea of this joining together of people and this is what we see in genesis 2 
Man and woman were one flesh and they were naked and not ashamed. This goes beyond physical nakedness. What we see in Genesis, and we're going to unpack this when we get to Genesis 2 here in a few weeks, is that there is an openness in their emotional relationship. There's an openness in their spiritual relationship. There's a vulnerability in their, their mental state. And so all these things, emotional, mental, spiritual, basically lead us to a place where we are able to share in the sexual, physical experience together. Physical sexuality is not the end-all, be-all. It is the result of cultivating so much deeper intimacy at an emotional, mental, and spiritual level that then leads to a physical connectedness. This is God's design when it comes to the topic of sex. And so what we have here is that God is for sex, sex is for marriage, and now the physical experience between a man and woman, husband and wife in marriage, is now meant to be that capstone of this union that God has deeply woven in each of us as male and female. We have tried to abstract sex from the covenantal, deep, personal, emotional, spiritual union of man and woman, and it's to our destruction that we've tried to separate this. And no wonder we live in a context in which Men and women are insane sexually. Um, one researcher in this article called Cheap Sex and the Decline of Marriage noted just a few years ago that 15 years ago, married 25 to 34-year-olds outnumbered their never-married peers by a margin of 55 to 34%. 15 years later, most recently, those estimates have almost reversed with never marrieds outnumbering marrieds by 53 to 40%, which tells us that young Americans have quickly become wary of marriage. Why? Because this researcher points out he calls a more straightforward and primal exploration for slow pace towards marriage. For American men, sex has become rather cheap. Now listen to this. As compared to the past, many women today expect little in return for sex in terms of time, attention, commitment, or fidelity. Men, in turn, do not feel compelled to supply these goods as they once did, and so the new sexual norm for Americans and men and women alike of every age is this, cheap sex. And again, what happens is the belittling of who we are as human beings that are meant for deeper connection than just the physical act of sex. And we have to understand God's larger design in this. Sex is precious. And there's a reason why God has set parameters. There's a reason why God has set boundaries. I have never seen somebody install a fence around a batch of weeds. Have you ever seen this before? Like, I really want to protect the weeds, so I'm going to put a fence around. No, you put a fence around something precious that you want to protect. I've stayed in a hotel before where there's a safe in the room, and you don't put dirty socks in the safe and hope no one breaks in and steals your dirty socks. You put a wallet, you put jewelry in there. Why? Because you've acknowledged something as precious and priceless, and you're going to do whatever it takes to protect that. This is the mentality of God. And it ought to be the mentality of God's people. So it is the issue of um, design. Secondly, sex is about worship. It's the issue of purpose. Sex and worship are not disconnected. As a matter of fact, we've talked about sex and spirituality in the past couple weeks. But let's talk about a, a few points that are important. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 on probably one of the most important teachings on this topic that's found in the Bible. Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And you're going to want to take some notes here, write in your Bibles or, or take some, some really good notes. There are four points that I just want to quickly draw out for you. Number one, there's this principle of present mastery. There's this idea that something has master over you, and what is that? Number two, there's this principle of future hope. Third, there is this principle of special union. And last, there's this principle of love, loving ownership. We'll talk through this. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul wants us to be the best worshipers possible. 
God has saved us to worship Him. And we don't just worship Him with certain parts of our lives, we worship Him with all of our lives. Look at chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them, yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. So stop right there. First thing we need to to see is that Paul says that while I could go out and do anything I want, all things are lawful for me, he, he adds an important point, but not all things are profitable. I mean, this is true not only in the context of sex, but you can go ahead and fill in the blank with anything that, sure, in Christ you have liberty to do whatever you want to do, but is it ultimately going to be profitable for your spiritual health? So Paul says, the way we conduct our lives now really reveals what's truly mastering us. Who who has ruling authority over my life? There's a lot of people out there that would tell you, I'm saved, but I'm going to go ahead and live my life like hell. I like Jesus as Savior, but I don't like Him as Lord. I like the fact that He's taken me away from my sins, but there's no way I'm going to allow Him to dictate how I live my life. Fire insurance, which in the end is no gospel at all. You don't come to Christ because, yeah, I get to avoid hell. Or you don't come to Christ because I get to go be with my mom who I knew know Jesus, so I'm going to go be reunited with her. You come to Christ because you realize he is beautifully awesome, a perfect redeemer who has saved us from our sins and the only one that could do that, God in the flesh. And now because what you've received from him by grace through faith, right, evidence of his mercy, you now in turn say, I'm going to live my life showing the world he's my master, he's my Lord. Yeah, you can do anything you want, but why would you? Why would you? And so why this is important is because how you conduct yourself sexually, either people will recognize God's existence or they will recognize the denial of God's existence in you. Don't miss this. Your body is not your own. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So the uh, principle of present mastery is important. See, sex is one of a whole catalog of created things that are good things, but can become bad things when they become ruling things. I will not be mastered by sex. I will not be mastered by my appetite for food. I will not be mastered by my love for sports. I will not be mastered by my, my love for cars. I will not be mastered for my, you know, mastered in my love but for, I will be mastered by my love or in my love for Christ. This is what Paul says. Because all this other stuff's going to be done away with. So he says, flee immorality. The body is not for this, but it is for the Lord. For the Lord is for the body. Second point, verse 14. Now God not only has raised Jesus the Lord, but will also raise us through his power. See, what Paul says here in this one verse is that God is preparing us for another home, another world. Lori had mentioned this during the songs this morning, that life is preparation for the world to come. This world is not all there is. Right? Like that bumper sticker that came out years ago, right? You know, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, he who dies with the most toys dies. Right? That's the point. The point is that life is preparation for the world to come. And so I reflect in my life a principle for future hope. That what I cannot get through earthly satisfaction here on earth is meant to be satisfied in Christ and boy, that satisfaction is going to come to fulfillment in eternity. And so the idea that there's this principle that we must hold our our appetites at bay, that there are things in this world that will never satisfy us and we are being prepared for a world yet to come. The words of Proverbs are pretty powerful. Proverbs chapter 7 uh, Solomon warns his son by, by holding fast to his love for, for God and to persevere through life because he says temptations are, are, are deadly. They're, they're insidious. 
with much seductive speech, you're going to come across a woman. She's going to persuade you with her smooth talk. She compels you. All at once, you're going, to, you're going to follow her. And as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into the snare. You guys get the idea? When, when, we, when we, be, we, we pretend that you know, the, the sexual appetite is to be filled at all possible costs in all possible places, we do not know that it will ultimately cost us our lives. See, we, we, we are mastered by the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't allow our appetites to master us. We, we are mastered by him because he's preparing us for an eternal home. Because how many people are losing their lives because they're buying into a lie? See, this is not just true for men. This is true for women. Because why? We are sexual people, and that's a good thing. But we need to put restraints on our sexuality. Point number three, there's the principle of a special union. Now, Here's something unique that maybe some of you have never thought of before. Verse 15, he reminds us, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? May it never be. Essentially, he's saying because you are in Christ, there's a union now that has taken Jesus. Jesus is in you and you're in Jesus. And now there's this inseparable union between you and Christ. You're going to go visit a prostitute what you're doing if you have union with Christ is you're taking Jesus with you. Do you want to link Jesus with a prostitute? This is the line of thinking for Paul. And we sit there and go, are you crazy? No. Or do you not know that the, the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. There is a special bonding that takes place with a sexual union that we are not to take for granted. But the bonding and the connectedness begins to wear away quickly the more we jump from partner to partner. Kind of like a post-it note. Now, who doesn't love post-it notes, right? Now, we all know what's amazing about post-it notes, and I got some really good post-it notes. I mean, you can tell just by peeling it off, right? This thing's really, really sticky. But if all of a sudden this post-it note represents my sexuality, and I, and I just go and I go, I'm going to put my post-it note right there. And then I take that post-it note off. Then I go ahead and put my post-it note there and take that post-it note off. What if I put this post-it note right there? Three people I've touched with this post-it note. It's not as sticky as it once was. It's, it's, it's lost something as I've gone from person to person, as I've taken something that I was designed to, to do, now has lost something that makes it so unique in what it's supposed to do. Our sexual lives are like post-it notes. And God says there's a, there's a binding that ought to happen, but the, the more casually you treat this topic of sex, the less binding there is. And so Paul says, think about your union with Christ. You would never say, Jesus, sleep with this woman with me, will you? Jesus, sleep with this man with me, will you? Jesus has come to free us. From such surface, trivial existence. Jesus is saying sex is good. He's designed it. But he's designed it to be held in honor and esteem with great importance and preciousness. This is why the union with Christ is special. This is why in verse 17 he says, But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one in spirit with him. This is, that's our ultimate bond. And we should never bring disgrace upon this. So he says, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin is a, that a man commits is outside the body. Don't miss this. But the immoral man, the sexually immoral person, sins against his own body. So what Paul says is there's something different about sexual sins. Now I will tell you that there is no such thing as an unforgivable sex, sexual sin. Amen. No matter what has ever been done to us or we have done to another, there is forgiveness and healing because of Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now that there is nothing you have ever done or ever been done to you that cannot get healed by Christ. See, Paul says, wherever you're at right now, just stop. Matter of fact, don't stop. Run. Run like hell. Flee immorality. Because you need to understand that there's something more deadly with sexual sins than any other sins. All other sins a man commits outside of his body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. 
This is not something to be dabbled with. This is not something to play with or toy with. You have a special union with Christ. And I'm going to tell you right now, what's amazing about the, the union you have with Christ is this fact that he not only comes and becomes one with you, he brings his tool chest of resources to help you live the life you are designed to live. This is amazing. Consider this the, the principle of loving ownership. The idea that he is Lord, he has come to now dwell with you, and he brings the provisions of his grace, and he basically says, I will give you everything you need to overcome the, the desires, the yearnings, the temptations, the enticements, because now I dwell with you, and I come with a whole arsenal of resources for you. Yes! God never asks us to do things that he's not ready to empower us to do. Amen? He never will call us to live a life that he's not ready to empower us to live. So loving ownership says, or do you not know, verse 19, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now how many of you have heard this verse taken out of context? And verses of the Bible are taken out of context all the time, for better or for worse. You shouldn't smoke. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm not saying smoking's okay. But you can't take that verse and directly apply it to that immediate situation. This verse has to do with sexual connectedness. You shouldn't have a third Bosa donut, even though I love Bosa donuts. I shouldn't do it. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> FYI, Boston cream, apple fritters. That's, that's, my, that's my bag, all right? So, but just so you know, and I say that in case you guys want to pick me up some donuts this week. And what is Pastor Scott like again? Oh, yeah. See, what we have to understand is, yes, we want to take care of ourselves physically. We want to honor God in the way we, we, we treat our bodies with health and respect. And, but first and foremost, this verse, when you hear it, autom automatically say we are sexual creatures and we are not designed for sexual immorality, meaning against God's design. But we need to realize that my body is to be saved for my future husband if you're a wife or a future wife if you're a man. That's how you honor God in your body. You do not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own. You are no longer owner of your body, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. This has to do with ownership. There's a new landlord in town, let me just tell you, he's awesome. He's moved in, and it's like, under new management, though you sit there go, ooh, this seems interesting, let's check out the place, because it was a dive before. Rats and all sorts of infestation going on under new management. Oh, I hope it's good. And that's what God posts over our lives when we come to know Jesus. He says, under new management. And we're great that the landlord's moved in because I tell you, we have not been able to keep up with the expenses left to our ownership. Pipes are breaking, cockroaches crawling. It's nasty. And God says, oh, we're going to boost this place up. This place is going to look good. Why? Because he dwells there. And when he dwells there, he takes special, special pride in being there. And so your sex life, you guys, will either be shaped by acting as if your body belongs to you or by acknowledging that it has been purchased by God for a higher purpose. Sex is about worship. There's no way around it. Third point. There's the issue of others. Sex is about relationship. And I'm going to tell you right now that oftentimes the illicit sex experience, at the heart of it, is pride and selfishness. I, I want to talk about this because this is where I think a lot of us will, will find ourselves in just saying, how can I understand sex not only as an opportunity to worship God, but how can I use it as an opportunity to honor others? Meaning the great commandment found in Matthew 22, love God, love your neighbor. Don't you love how Jesus teaches? He goes, let me take the entire Old Testament and I'm going to sum it up into two commands. Love God, love your neighbor. What our current, and I won't even say current, what our sexuality over centuries has driven us to do is to seek sexual experience for our own selfish gratification. 
with no consideration for God and no consideration for other people. Okay? What we have to understand is sex is about relationships. And so here's the problem, number one, of anti-relational sex. It's this, this root of selfishness that has now plagued our relationships. We treat it as just another appetite to be satisfied, and it does two things. Selfishness leads to disregard and loving your God, and selfishness also leads to dishonoring loving your neighbor. Anti-relational sex basically says, God, I disregard your ways, your will, your word, your law, your love, your design, your mandates, your commands. Total disregard, not only for God, but then it says, I will use another human being for what I want to get out of it, and that does nothing but dishonor the other person. Anti-relational sex is not sex according to God's design. See, sex is only ever purified and protected when it motivates us in thought, desire, and action and is loving and submissive and joyful and willing street-level love for God. When deep down inside I say, God, you know how I'm wired. You know how much I, I want to experience this. I will wait for marriage for this to happen. And in the context of marriage, I'm going to honor you and how I take care of my wife because how I take care of my wife and my worship of you are tied together. That we have to understand that sexual sin always has a lack of love for God at its core. What we are doing when it comes to illicit sexual experiences is we're replacing the love that we ought to have for God and placing it in something that was never designed to satisfy us. Can I, can I say this again? When it comes to feeding this appetite that has been designed in us, we are replacing the love we ought to have for God and trying to find some meager substitute that was never in itself designed to satisfy us. Because what happens, especially when it comes to this, this world of sexuality, is that one lust is pursued after another lust, is pursued after another lust, and those lusts are like cotton candy. They may satisfy you for a few minutes, but they're not going to satisfy you in the long run. This is why James in chapter 1 says, Sin gives birth to lust, and lust gives birth to death. Because there's nothing beneficial that comes from the illicit sexual desire. When we're involved in sexual sin, meaning sin outside God's clear boundaries, we have done what we've done because we do not love God as we should. So really, the issue is this. God is to be on the throne of my heart and I should fight for the desire for Him more than I fight for the desire of anything else. This is an issue of desire. See, it would be so easy to point at the culture and blame our society and point at all the, the, the circumstances and situations. And in reality, what we're talking about is really each and every one of our own hearts. And this is why I praise God for the teachings of Jesus and the focus of the Bible. It is always on us. Where is your heart? Is Jesus enthroned on your heart or have you dethroned God and put some meager substitute in place? I must fight. I'm going to tell you right now. I must fight for a heart controlling desire for God. I must fight for this in my own heart that God is more satisfactory than anything this world could ever offer. Amen? I must fight that the desires, while they may be good, but they will never be satisfied unless they are satisfied in God. You are my shepherd, and because of you I shall not want. And so the struggle for sexual purity is really a struggle to keep God in His rightful place in my heart. But secondly, it not only... It has to do with a, a disregard for God in our sexual exploits, but it has to do with dishonoring other people and loving our neighbor. Illicit sex never treats another as an object of affection. 
Selfish sexual pursuits never seek another person because we unconditionally love them or we're seeking their good or we're wanting to help them in their, their place of need. So much of what people pursue in their sexual experiences is fundamentally anti-relational. Let me, let me quote for you uh, another article, uh, Cheap Sex and the Decline of Marriage from, from last year. They reported a, a man by the name of Kevin, 24-year-old recent college graduate from Denver, Wants to get married someday and is almost 100% positive that he will. But soon, he says, I'm not going to get married because I'm not done being stupid yet. I want to go out and have sex with a million girls, he says. He believes he's figured out how to do that. Girls are easier to mislead than guys just by lying or just not really caring. If you know what a girl wants, then you know you should not give in to them until the proper time. But if you do that strategically, then you can really have anything you want, whether it's a relationship, sex, or whatever. You have the control. Kevin was one of 100 men uh, and women from a cross-section of American communities that uh, this team interviewed five years ago as they sought to understand how adults in their 20s and early 30s think about relationships. He sounds like a jerk, but it's hard to convince him that his strategy won't work because it has for him and countless other men. People like Kevin expect to make the transition from this selfish outlook to committed relationship, but it isn't that easy. Listen to this. Psychologist Scott Stanley of University of Denver sees visible daily sacrifices such as accepting inconveniences in order to see a woman as the way that men typically show their developing commitment. It signals the expectation of a future together. Small, such small instances of self-sacrificing love may sound simple, but they are less likely to develop when past and present relationships are founded on the expectation of cheap grace. Cheap sex, sorry, cheap grace, cheap sex. Meaning this, you cannot turn the tide when you've just been experiencing this kind of living for so long. Men and women enter the marriage union with such idealistic, dreams and hopes but when you have a relationship that is founded on what has just been described you're not going to be able to turn that ship apart from the power and grace of Jesus Christ you're not going to be able to turn that ship this is why pornography is so powerful listen to these statistics this blew me away this weekend in just one year 2016 we, did, we dedicated well over four and a half billion hours to watching porn on one porn site. On that single website, humanity spent twice as much time viewing porn in a year as it has spent existing on planet Earth. That site had over 90 billion video views and 44,000 visitors every minute of every day. It all adds up to over 500,000 years worth of porn consumed in the span of 12 months. Since 2015, human beings have spent 1 million years watching porn. Porn seems to be America's favorite pastime. The porn industry is worth $97 billion, which is about 100 times higher than the $750 million it was worth 20 years ago. Today, porn grosses more in a year than Hollywood. It also brings in more money than NFL, NBA, and uh, Major League Baseball combined. And that's just the legal W-2 filing porn stuff. If we were to quantify amateur porn and figure out what it's all worth in dollars, who knows what the number would be. And since the onset of more and more accessibility because of tablets, smartphones, etc., these things are not only getting into the hands of the adults who think they are powerful enough to overcome it, but they're getting into the hands of our children. And we think it's going to get easier. And we think we shouldn't talk about it. We need to. Because there is sex for love's sake when you are trying to do, all you're trying to do is use the body of another to, to reach physical sexual climax. It is a purely selfish pursuit. Porn is anti-relational. I will just get out of this what I want to get out of it. Porn videos do not tend to be love stories. You don't watch porn and go, boy, I really like the character development in this, in this, 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 this person. 
I really appreciate the arc of the story. And boy, it really does allow that romance to grow. And yet this is what people are have an appetite for. What about sex and advertising? Again, fundamentally anti-relational. The woman in any ad is reduced to something less than human. Hey, I've got a bikini on. Don't you want this Rolls Royce? Right? Hey, I've got a bikini on. Don't you want this hamburger? Look how amazing it looks. You don't want the hamburger. You want the woman in the bikini. And so what happens is this woman is now not respected for her mind. She's not respected for her character. She's not respected for her gift. We see these advertisements and we go, that woman is not esteemed. She is not loved. It is her sexuality that you're, you notice. It is your, her body that you desire. And it is purely anti-relational. And can I tell you that the opposite is the pleasure of relational sex. And this is God's original design. That in relationship with somebody of the opposite sex, now all of a sudden in the marriage context, you are able to experience something you've never experienced before. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. God is better than the best sex. Okay? God is better than the best sex. And here's why. Because when you spend time cultivating a relationship with somebody of the opposite sex and you enter the marital union, you begin to grow in fondness and forgiveness and intimacy and bonding and you get to know a person, over time, the sex in that context gets better. Someone, I, I heard someone talk about this, and they, they framed it really, really well. They said to this person, you've only had sex with one person, your wife, for, for 20 years? That's boring. And they said, actually, I have never made love to the same woman in 20 years. Because as I've gotten to know her, and invest in this relationship, she has grown and matured and blossomed in ways I never thought possible. And every time we now, not every time, but when we come to that special union that God has designed, there is something new that can be experienced. Because why? The pleasure of relationship when it comes to our sexuality. Proverbs chapter 5. See, God is for sex, remember? God is so for sex, this is why... Solomon says to his son in Proverbs chapter 5, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always with her love. My kids know this verse. They go, what? But it's good. Why? Because it puts it in context. With your wife, be intoxicated in her love. You know what that means? Get drunk with how intense your relationship with her is. Yeah! Song of Solomon. This is why several times in the Song of Solomon, the woman says to the man, do not awaken love until its proper time. And the woman who is going to be this man's wife says there will come a time when we will awaken love together. You will be able to climb the palm trees and snatch the fruit and, and all these wonderful images we get, this, 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 this allegory, right? these metaphors. But it's interesting that Song of Solomon says, here's what is true and proper, that you tend to your harvest, that you invest in the harvest, but you don't bear the fruit from the harvest until it's proper time. You, you tend to it, you take care of it, you cultivate it, and you don't dare try to do anything prematurely because you've got to wait till the moment when awakened love is the best love because it's come to its full fruition. This is the message of Solomon to the world. That there is pleasure to be found in relational sex. Last, the issue of authority. And this is really has to do with the God-honoring sexuality that destroys autonomy and the God-honoring sexuality that destroys self-sufficiency. So, will I do what God wants me to do? 
And this is really important, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with this point because it's going to really segue into our discussion next week, where the church in our culture has largely, on this topic, been just accused of being so loving and so condemning of, you name the group. You know, the, the homosexuals, those who are confused when it comes to their gender identity. And, and you know, there's so much in-house crap we need to deal with. Don't you dare try to remove the speck from someone else's eye when you've got a log in your own. Let's talk about pornography. Let's talk about marital infidelity. Let's talk about adultery. Let's talk about divorce, right? How dare we try to teach the culture on proper sexuality when we don't have our stuff together? Okay? We are all in the same boat with having wayward hearts. We are all in the same boat with missing the, the mark of what God expects. Don't you dare have a holier-than-thou attitude. Don't you dare enter a culture with some sort of air of superiority. You're not all that in a bag of chips. I'm sorry to have to tell you this. But we also want to do our best in leading an honest, earnest life and saying, yeah, we love Jesus and we want to do our best in honoring him with our lives. What does the issue of authority have to do with us? Sex is about obedience. John 14, verse 15, if you love me, Jesus says, you will obey my commandments. Before you start telling the world where they're wrong, and do, are you surprised that people who don't know God are, are wayward? Weren't you wayward at one time? Weren't you lost and not found? Weren't you were blind and you did not see? We, we get all like flabbergasted that the culture acts the way it does. You acted the same way when you did not know Christ. Here's our message. I'm not going to turn your sexuality around. I'm not going to change your identity, hopefully bring insight into your gender confusion. I'm not going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the hope and the, and the love that's found in Jesus Christ. That's where it starts. Okay? You, you can't control culture. You can't change people, but you can tell them about Jesus. But you do it from a place where you say, first and foremost, I'm going to honor Jesus in my life. How do you say you love Jesus when you don't honor him by following his commands? So this is why, number one, God honoring sexuality says, I am not ruler over my body. I cannot do what I want with my body. I am under new ownership. I am owned by somebody else. He is Lord. He is master. And so the reality of it is this, by means of creation, you are God's and your sex life is his. He tells you now what to do. And it's not because he's some cosmic killjoy who wants to take the joy out of life. No, he is setting you up for the best possible experience. And so this means that you do not have a natural right to do with your life and your body as you please. And again, doesn't that go against the grain of the mentality of people out there? Like, who are you to tell me how to live my life? Well, you take that when it comes to your sex life. Well, transfer that to your finances. Translate that to, you know, how often you pay your taxes or when you drive the speed limit or you underpay or overpay for something you buy at the store. Whatever. Christ is Lord and he has mastery over everything. We don't bifurcate our lives and say, this part's spiritual, this part's secular. Right? He has me holistically. Amen? Which brings us to the last point, self-sufficiency. We are dependent beings and we have fundamental needs that we can never meet on our own. We need God. We make mistakes. We fall short. And all I'm saying when it comes to the topic of obedience is this. It is the willing submission of my heart to God that causes me to do what God has commanded me to do without challenge, without excuse, without delay. Here's what I can control. You guys ready for this? Here's what I can control. My heart with the power of God. I can't control you. And I'm not, right, I, I have just saved you hundreds of hours of professional counseling with that one phrase right there. Too many people spend their lives trying to control people that they were never called to control. To try to change circumstances that you are powerless to control. 
All you are responsible for at the end of the day is your own life. And for those of us in Christ Jesus, you have been given every resource, all the power needed to do what God has wanted you to do as a God-honoring person. And so now, fundamentally, I am dependent upon God and I need Him daily. I am desperate for His help. And so now, it's not just mere behaviors that God wants to get a hold of with me. It's, it's boundaries. It's basically saying, God, you have deemed this off limits. I will honor you in respecting and acknowledging that. I'm not going to go there. Some of you just like to test God's long suffering, don't you? When God puts the wet paint sign up, you're like, oh yeah, really? Aren't we all little stubborn, rebellious kids at heart? In reality, we have boundary issues going on. And I know that without God's boundaries, I would wander into dangers that would be my doom. And that's why Jesus says, this is why you pray, Lord, deliver us from evil and lead us not into temptation. This is critical. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal you, therefore, brothers, sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. How you present, how you conduct, your behaviors, everything. Spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. The world's saying, live this way. And you're saying, no, I'm not going to live that way. And how do you do this? You are doing this by the transformation of your mind, the renewal of your mind, that is by testing what you may discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Commit that to memory. One of the first verses I memorized as a believer in Jesus Christ. Secondly, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul writes this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Scott Morgan is dead. Eve Jacob is dead. John Ferguson is dead. But Christ now lives in me. This habitat has been taken over by new management. The old is gone, the new has come. And the life I now live, because of the new management of the Lordship of Christ, I live by faith, dependency, right? Trusting someone bigger, better, more knowledgeable than me, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Why wouldn't we now want to live our lives with this in mind? And so, we close with this. This is foundational. Every person needs to hear this. Every person needs to understand this. We need to pass this on to our children. And all of us have a responsibility because it takes a village, amen, to pass this on to people we come in contact with. They don't know this. They need to know it. Next week, how do we now engage a culture with this as our foundation to not only engage but to encourage and say we cannot continue the course we are going because, again, we all have to acknowledge that we live in a very destructive society and you're not going to put the blame on guns. You're not going to put the blame on video games. You're not going to put the blame on porn. You're going to put the blame on the wayward hearts that exist in every person. How do we help change a culture with the power of God and the word of God on our side? Amen? So that's what we're going to unpack next week. and We will deal with a lot of different topics next week. And again, parental Discretion is advised. My prayer for us is this, and I pray this for you as a church. Regularly I pray, may we all live in a manner worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus. Amen? May we live pure, holy lives because the enemy is trying to just sabotage the faith. He's trying to sabotage our purity. Let's stand. Let's pray together. Father, Thank you for this morning. Thank you for loving us, for giving us time in your word by showing us a better way. My prayer for, for all of us, including myself, is this. Forgive us, Father, for buying into something that falls far short of what you really want for us. Help us to live for your glory. Empower us to live for your honor. Lord, help us to live lives of obedience, Lord. Trust in you that you are more satisfactory than anything our hearts could ever want. That the appetite that exists within us is not to be satisfied things of this world, but it is meant to be satisfied by you. As the deer pants for the water, may our souls long for you, O oh God. 
May we hunger and thirst for righteousness. And may we live for your glory. Because we know when we live for your glory, it is for our good. Thank you for this time today. Guide us and direct our steps. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace and mercy forever. Have a great week, you guys. All right? Thank you.